Okay, good evening, Council. Let me just do a head count and see if we have everyone here. Missing one, missing one. We will get started though. Um, I would like to call the meeting to order and welcome everyone here tonight. Um, I can confirm we have quorum and are missing one counselor, but expect him to be joining us shortly. Um, I'm going to read the land acknowledgement statement tonight and, and following it, I'm going to read another statement. Uh, so starting with the land acknowledgement statement, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe under the terms of the Robinson Huron Treaty 61 of 1850 and the Williams Treaties of 1923. We commit to acknowledge, learn, educate, create opportunity, honor sacred places, and take actions toward real truth and reconciliation in support of our commitment to walking the path together in respect, peace, and harmony for future generations. Um, I think the events over the last number of weeks um, have never made this statement more powerful than it is right now. And in honor of the victims of the residential schools in Canada, the Canadian flags at municipal buildings were lowered to half mast on Saturday, June 26th. And that's the second time we've done that in the last few weeks. We did it for the 215 lost lives in Kamloops and um, we did it again for the lost lives in Saskatchewan. We will, however, raise our flags back up tomorrow as we look to other ways to honor and recognize the graves discovered to date and the others that are sure to follow. As we approach Canada Day, a day that we acknowledge as Canada's birthday, may it also be a day that we reflect and confront our country's past and the horrific mistreatment of Indigenous peoples across Canada. On July 1st, I would like to encourage our community to acknowledge this and to really consider how we can do better to build a better future for everyone. The municipality will be placing orange ribbons around the community to show support and raise awareness for Indigenous peoples. May we as Canadians let our Indigenous people know that we see them, that we mourn with them, and that we support them. While our usual Canada Day community celebrations have been postponed due to COVID, I would also like to suggest that we do not run the Canadian Spirit Photo Contest that we had planned to do. In, in light of the COVID restrictions. I would also like to request council support to start the discussions for a permanent public memorial to help with the healing. And to that end, I will speak next week with the Muskoka Area Indigenous Leadership Table and bring back some appropriate proposals for something that we could do on a more permanent basis. While these are very small steps, they are the first steps. And I know our council is eager to continue this conversation with the community on how Huntsville can build, help build a better Canada and raise awareness. So with your support council, I will raise that and, uh, and our staff will put out an announcement um, that we will not do anything um, specific for Canada Day this year. Okay, um, the clerks have Assign movers and seconders as usual. So I have a resolution moved by Councillor Schumacher and seconded by Councillor Stone be it resolved that the regular council meeting agenda dated Monday, June 28, 2021 be adopted as printed and circulated uh, with the following change and that's the removal of the Muskoka River watershed update. All in favor? That carries. And welcome Councillor Withy. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, we will go into our first invited presentation and that's our fire prevention officer, Mike Badna. Hi, Mike. Hi, how you doing? Good, do you have a, a presentation or just gonna talk yeah. to us? Yeah, no, okay. I have a presentation, um, so I'll have to share, hang on. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay.
Okay, so um, the District of Muskoka and the Merck Committee, um, we've um, looked at uh, some ways of notifying people um, in, the, in the event of an emergency. So um, this presentation, I'm, I'm gonna show you a short video, hopefully no technical difficulties, um, and talk about the Muskoka Emergency Response Committee. I, I'm sure you're all aware of it. Um, and then a bit about the Voyant Alert and then some questions. So I'll, I'll make it brief, but um, let me play this video here. I'm just gonna exit this screen, find my other screen here. Can everybody see that then? Yep. I think we still see your same screen, but. Oh, okay, hang on. Let me. Uh... Let me just adjust that. New share. The wonders of, there we go. You should see that now. Yeah, I think it's coming on, yes. We have no sound, Mike, should we? Oh, no? No. Okay, well, um, I'll switch back to this. Sorry about that. Um, let me go back to the presentation. Oops. Yeah, I don't know why there's no sound, but uh, it was just a short introduction to the buoyant alert, but I'm gonna explain it all here anyway. So um, the Muskoka Response Committee um, it's the area, the six area municipalities and the first two nation or first nation communities. Um, we have Bracebridge and Huntsville OPP that sit on it. And the district of Muskoka, of course, uh, the district CEMC is the chair. And we meet uh, every three months just to go over um, a lot of our priorities with our emergency plans and um, making sure we're all in line. So buoyant alert, we looked at, um, it's a local emergency notification. So the, the province does have that, um, that province wide alert that we could utilize if we had to. And it is somewhat geo-targeted to certain areas. Um, this buoyant alert, um, we, can, we can go right down to a, a small little area say, so, so what interested me about it was with our flooding, um, is that Big East River area. I mean, we, we could, could geo-target down to there. Um, so it's a multi-purpose, obviously, and um, um, it's a community notification platform. It's free. There's no cost to the public and they can sign up for it. Um, so we looked, at, we looked at a bunch of them. We had a subcommittee that looked at a bunch of them through Merck. And um, there were four demonstrations done. This uh, buoyant alert, we, we selected because of the simplicity of it. And there, there's like standardized um, templates that we can use. We can all, there's also, um, which interests me, I just have to get through the, uh, our IT department and try to figure out how we're gonna do it, but it's also also can be used for our emergency control group notifications. So if we have to pull the, the control group together, um, it's, it's a very simple process and I can actually 
um, if I sent out an alert to the emergency control group, um, I could get a response back that, yeah, I'll be there in 15 minutes. There's questions I can set up. I'll be there or I won't be there, that type of thing. So Boeing alert um, is a critical incident notification. And um, I'll stress that because that's, that's what we're using it for right now, only for emergencies. Um, it, it can be customized so that say like um, for the district garbage pickup, things like that um, are, are sent out. But um, our main objective was to have it for emergencies only. So the, the beauty of it is that the user can select um, different areas. So um, the, the, the trial one that I have right now I've got it set up uh, at work. Um, I've got it set up here at home. So if there's notifications for that area, um, it'll be specific to that area. So say like, um, um, you know, uh, school, they, you can set up your child's school and anything that happens in that area, it would notify you right away. Um, so there, there's lots of uh, um, use in it. So there's no, um, no message fatigue because um, they can select how they want to be notified. So there, there's a text, email, or by phone even, there's a phone message that can go out. Um, and registration is easy. It, um, it's basically done. I, I refer everybody to the District of Muskoka website to, to um, set up their... Um, their username and stuff. And there's a app you can download as well, which I'll show you. Um, so the annual expense uh, was $4,000, but the district is picking that up. And that's the beauty of it. Um, uh, obviously why we jumped on board uh, with all the municipalities, it just makes sense to have one central um, entity looking after it. So. Um, the, the good thing is we can have unlimited subscribers and we have all our administrators. So all the um, municipalities are represented and are able to send out alerts. Um, so we, we can send notifications uh, via the, the app or on, on a desktop. Um, there's templates that I've started setting up for um, notifications for you know, when the, when the waters say are rising on the uh, Big East River, uh, we can give them an alert there. Um, and the support is, is phenomenal. So that, that's, that was another factor of why we ended up going with them. Uh, so moving forward, uh, like I said, it's only emergency alerts at this time. Um, we've been we've been pushing it out. We started during emergency preparedness week, and we started pushing it out. And um, uh, eventually, we I mean, the, more so the district, um, but I, I'm sure even public works. I could see stuff that they could push out with that if if needed, be, because of the ability to geo target an area, um, and that that's the beauty of it. So. Um, Actually, I won't go to questions yet. I just wanted to mention, like right now, it's at, at the infant stage. And I, I believe we're at uh, 1,685 um, uh, registrations so far. So um, as we move along, we have it on our website now. Each municipality has it on their website. And we try to push it out through social media um, to get people to sign up. But uh, definitely, if you get a chance, is, is um, download the app and um, register yourself. And that way you can receive notifications. So uh, ho I'm hoping in the next month or so, we'll have our IT stuff sorted out and I can get our emergency control group set up. Um, it just, we, we need to download that app. So that, that's the first thing. And that'll have to go on our on our work phones. So um, 
Yeah, a a any questions on that? Okay, thanks, Mike. If you stop sharing your screen, then I can see all of the council and we'll see if there okay. are questions. Uh, let me stop share. There we go. And there we're back. Okay, council, questions of Mike. Councilor Schumacher. Unmute myself. Uh, pretty simple, Mike. I'm sure it's compatible with both Android and iOS. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And maybe you can just send us the link to the video so we can watch it. Yeah, I will do that. I'll send it to Tanya and she can send it out to you for sure. Yep. Councilor Armour. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Through you to Mike. Hey, Mike. Um, one thing I, I have it downloaded already on my phone. I'm just curious who's in control of sending the alerts out? Do you have to send it to one person or do you have control of that being in the downtown phone? So um, each municipality has control as well as the district. So if it, if it was affecting more than two municipalities, um, it, would, it would most likely come from the district, district the, the um, notification. But as far as uh, just for us, if, if we had an issue in um, um, the Big East River, I, I could geo-target just that area for the people that are signed up there. Mike, would that mean that you could geo-target, say, if you if somebody saw a tornado coming through, the actual anticipated path of it? Uh, definitely, yeah. Um, that that would be something. I mean, as long as we had that that, um, or if we knew the path of it, um, we could um, set it up so that it ge or it only notifies those people in the path. But I think in, in that case, if we had um, the Environment Canada warnings for Muskoka and, and there was an imminent tornado, it would go out to the whole region. I mean, for us, that's the easiest. And, and we have those templates set up. Okay. And I think uh, I have it on my phone, but I haven't received anything as of yet. But I, I think you mentioned you can, you can receive it either by a telephone call, a text or an email. Yes, depending on how they sign up. Um, and we, we were also looking at maybe um, monthly or bi-monthly tests, just so that people know that it's working. Um, and, and that might come, we might even do it quarterly say, because we don't want to overload it too much. And, and that's one thing we talked about with, you know, like your, your uh, garbage delivery and things like that. I think it would just overload it and people would get tired of it right yeah so. okay i think uh, so the message to the community is is download the app or or sign up um whichever way you want to do it on online or or buy an app but but get, get access to it so that uh, you can be notified of emergencies right most definitely yeah okay all right i don't see any other questions so thanks mike and um I'm sure we probably have this information on our own website, but if we don't, we'll get it up there too. Perfect, yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, our, our second invited presentation tonight is from the Huntsville Mott Association and Jesse Hamilton, the chair of that organization is here. And it looks like another PowerPoint pres presentation, but welcome, Jesse. Thank you, Karen, and hello everybody. I will share my screen. I assume you can see that okay, everyone? We can. Great, thank you. Um, your worship, town councillors and town staff, thanks very much for your time today. Um, I do hope and I believe that uh, what I'll share with you today will be a review. Uh, it's meant just simply to be an update for town council on what's been happening um, with the Municipal Accommodation Tax Association. Um, it's been certainly a, a tough 15 months for, for everyone, no matter uh, what line of work you're in, but uh, certainly for the businesses that our organization is meant to support um, and for all of those who sit on the board, it's also uh, been certainly a challenging time. So I think an update's uh, definitely a, a good thing to do. Um, I'm also hoping that uh, 
soon we will all stop working on things that are constantly postponed or delayed due to COVID or anything else, because uh, that's happened certainly a lot. But um, I think that's lining us up for a pretty, pretty exciting uh, fall as a result as well. So um, what I'll take you through today, if there was one takeaway uh, from it all that I hope um, to share with you, we know that sort of our for being as an organization is to grow year-round occupancy in the town of Huntsville. Um, and every sort of plan or decision that we're making is, is sort of based on that goal. But at the same time, when we review the programs that have taken place over the last um, year and a half, it's important to note that the programs have be, been designed in such a way that there is a substantial economic impact to businesses in our community that aren't just accommodators. Um, and so again, if there's something that I'm hoping you'll take away from today, that's, um, that's it. The board of directors uh, is listed there in front of you. A couple changes that I'll mention. Um, Nate Smith has joined our board, uh, replacing the position that was held by Christine Kropp. Um, as recent as Thursday, uh, Steve Carr has joined the board uh, as a Halaba representative. Um, and he's filling the spot um, that Matthew Phillips once held and Matthew's no longer working in an accommodation business in our town. Um, so he has had to, to step down. I'd also like to take a, a quick moment just to recognize Kashal Gandhi, who passed away in December of last year. He was uh, a member of our board as well, and certainly an important part of our community and in our industry specifically. Partnership programs, just wanted to do a quick review of those. Uh, this was what we hoped would be sort of a very quick um, spearheading of programs that would make a difference in the community pretty quickly while we got to sort of the the work of the board that maybe doesn't put something money into market right away. Although most were canceled due to COVID, um, we were able to partner with OFSAA uh, for timing equipment and other supplies for ski races. Um, half ice boards were purchased uh, via Huntsville Girls Hockey um, as well. Uh, Retreat to Nature was a two year program, we think, uh, but we did approve and work uh, with someone on a health and wellness website, which will meant is meant to um, create interest in our town from a health and wellness standpoint for overnight visitors. Uh, and then the support that we had set aside for both the BIA in town and the Chamber of Commerce. Now I wanna review the two partnerships that we did with, with the RTO. Um, the first one that you'll see here on your screen is Winter Wonders. The, there was a lot of discussion at our board about doing a program like this one. Um, and whether or not we would take that on as our own. Um, but two key reasons for why we decided to partner with the RTO. First of all, they had done very similar programs to this across Muskoka, all of which proved to be a success. So they had the sort of infrastructure already in place um, to deliver on it. And everyone who operates a business, or most who operate a business in Huntsville had already participated in their existing programs. So if this was to look and feel like that program, it would be easy for everyone to get on board. Second of all, it's an opportunity for us to leverage uh, tax dollars um, and in the sort of effort to be good stewards of that money by working with the RTO, we were able to amplify that money with, their, um, with them putting money into the pot as well. Um, so a couple of quick highlights on the Winter's Wonders program. Um, you can see the spend there shared between our board and the RTO. There were 505 packages sold that generated 1,161 room nights in the town of Huntsville over this time period. Um, and there was over $40,000 in business vouchers that were issued. So that was real money that went back into the hands of business owners in the town of Huntsville. Um, there was 15 grand spent on Facebook advertising. Uh, we over just shy of 4 million impressions and landing page views of just of almost 33,000. So not only does this drive actual room nights, it puts real money into the hands of other businesses at the same time too, it gives us an opportunity to market our destination with, with the vehicle to do so, which is the travel package. I also will note, I've just seen a, um, uh, recently saw a travel package like this one um, being done in Quebec. Um, and uh, it's just kind of sort of neat to see that we've been doing something similar as well. The second uh, partnership was Sweater Weather. Again, same formula. Um, this one was more focused on midweek stays, which are obviously a, more, a little more difficult to move, especially in the winter. Um, this was 300 packages that we sold, 836 room nights, and $30,000 worth of business vouchers were issued into the town of Huntsville. Um, 
these are programs that we are very, very proud of. Um, they are hitting our mandate perfectly in our opinion, not only in generating room nights, um, but also in, in uh, having an economic impact in, in other businesses. In terms of community support, um, we spent a lot of the time over the last 15 months trying to come up with things that would help businesses in our in industry in Huntsville with what was happening with the pandemic. And every time we thought we had something, it was delayed uh, or we couldn't do it. Um, the winter product development portion, that is the uh, lighting project. Um, and I'll mention that a little bit more, but that's uh, an investment of over $300,000. Um, $20,000 that we were very happy um, to award to the BIA for the Digging Down, Downtown Voucher Campaign. And I have to see, say everything that I've seen uh, from a marketing standpoint or communication standpoint around what's happening downtown has been, has been fantastic. Um, and then the recent uh, arts art crawl, which is happening with the Festival of the Arts, um, we also provided support financially to that initiative as well. Um, we have partnered with the Chamber of Commerce and with the town and the BIA um, for winter product development. Portions of this did happen this past winter. The sort of key highlight of this was going to be that um, lighting feature at Muskoka Heritage Place and also downtown as well. Um, but Winter Adventure Your Way was meant to create a number of reasons and activities for people to do in and around the town of Huntsville. That included the walk with light. Um, and this were, although it's been delayed, we're very excited to have this launching in October of this year. Um, and if you're looking for a silver lining, as I think we all are, uh, this is going to put a lot more eyes on our town for a longer period of time than this would have in winter. Um, and not only is that gonna be fantastic for all of our local residents, um, day visits also will be able to enjoy this. And it's certainly gonna give us um, a story to tell and a way to generate uh, overnight visits to the town of Huntsville. And we're getting very close to this project just being a flick of a switch. The Winter Adventure Park, um, sort of a multi-activity uh, outdoor playground uh, at Grandview Inn, um, ski trails, fat bikes, snowshoe trails. It did launch very softly this year uh, and we plan to have that return in 2021. Um, and then Snow Village, which was an animated winter playground at River Mill Park, um, and again, hoping to launch that in December of 2021. Important to note that um, specifically the map board is contributing money to the Walk with Light. Um, the Adventure Park and the Snow Village is happening through the Chamber uh, and Fest Festival of the Arts with funding that, that we have um, provided them with as well. I think this, as we get further and further away from um, wearing masks and, and feeling trapped in our houses, at the same time, we're going to see people traveling more freely outside of our province. Um, and right now, I think Huntsville is, is maybe one of the best positioned uh, towns in our province to be seeing the demand that we're seeing for people traveling in Ontario. But that's going to become more challenging for us as people are getting on planes again. So having a program like this one is going to help us highlight why you would come to Huntsville and generate those room nights and visits to our town. Um, the Digging Downtown campaign, I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with this. Um, 700 of those $30 voucher packages were given out in less than an hour, and, and a lot of this was made possible by funding from the MAP board as well. Um, and we all understand the, the full impact of that program um, once the program is finished. And again, I um, want to just say how, how wonderfully I think that is, that is going in terms of managing the experiences. And I can tell you from, from guests at Deerhurst, we're also, we're also hearing that as well. And the, the art crawl, um, the self-guided tour that's happening, um, 27 different stops. I'm sure everybody who is here has had a chance to take a look at it. Um, again, that's something that we are very, very happy that we were able to be, be a part of as well. Uh, everyone I'm sure on town council and, and a number of uh, town staff have had a chance to take a look at the travel intention study that we put together. Um, this was some groundwork to understand what comes next for us. Uh, at the same time, it gave us an opportunity to get some learnings immediately uh, that might help not only the map board itself, but businesses in the tourism space try to understand what people are thinking and how they're traveling. That's why we shared, obviously, that study with anyone who wanted to take a look at it. Um, it's going to be sort of a pivotal uh, document that will help us guide our, our future tourism plan as well. And then the last slide. Um, 
looking ahead, we have begun now focusing again on our tours and master plan. Um, the board uh, reviewed at our last meeting, which was just last week, uh, an RFP that we're putting together to go to market for the assistance in putting that plan together. Um, we will review another RFP in about a month's time before we put that out for, for tender. Um, this master plan has been a, a pretty important part of our agreement in the, in the three-year pilot program. Um, but as you can imagine, we've lost essentially the last 15 months um, to one, focusing on how we might be able to help businesses recover from the pandemic. And also, as you can imagine, that everyone on a board like, like that one was impacted by uh, the pandemic in, in one way or another. Um, and we're focusing on some things that needed to happen a little bit more immediately. Um, but we're all very excited to be turning our attention now uh, back to putting that master plan together. We did have a voucher program very similar to the ones we talked about a minute ago with the RTO. Um, it was meant to happen this spring, being uh, positive that things would change a little bit more quickly. Uh, obviously that did not happen and we'll be launching that in the fall. Uh, the model is very, very similar to the, to the two campaigns we talked about earlier. Um, we are very excited to be returning back to that partnership program. Uh, one of the things that I think our board likes most about that program is it, um, it puts sort of the, um, uh, the initiative in the hands of others in our town um, to sort of come forward and say, hey, I, I have a way to make a difference. I have a way to, you know, not only uh, generate some room nights, but to have an impact, positive impact in our community in one way or another. Um, and I like the way that that partnership program has people thinking it. A lot of people have been taking these thoughts that they've had and have found ways to um, include or incorporate generating room nights when maybe that wasn't the, the initial purpose of, of sort of that idea that they've had. And then, as we've mentioned already, um, looking forward to seeing everyone um, on this call and everyone in the town of Huntsville enjoying the launch of Eclipse Walk with Light at Muskoka Heritage Place soon. That is all I had in the way of updates for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And I can take any questions if you'd like, and I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, thanks, Jesse. That was uh, way more information than I'm ever able to share with council. <laughs> Every, every time I get to a, a map board update, I forget what we've been doing in the last oh. few days. But anyways, council, questions of Jesse. Councilor Withy. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thanks, Jesse, for that. Um, I was wondering what I, I was wondering what your sense was about the, the near future uh, with regards to tourism uh, where Canadians are going to be allowed to travel abroad, but the border is still closed. Uh, I'm hearing from people that they're, they're concerned there's going to be a devastating uh, impact on tourism in areas such as ours because all the Canadians will be leaving, getting on planes, going places, and uh, Americans won't be coming across the border. Do you have a sense of that? Um, uh, maybe a little off topic, I'm sorry, but just wondering what you thought. No, that's okay. Um, I don't have a, I probably don't have a sense of that that's worth more than anyone else's sense of it, to be honest with you. But, um, but I do see that being a reality that we need to be aware of. And I think that discussion will begin to take place at the map board level as well. Um, Huntsville, every time people are traveling freely or more freely in our province, our town is benefiting immensely. And I mean, I can tell you that I'm seeing that at Deerhurst, I'm hearing it from other hotel operators um, and, you know, a lot of our, my colleagues in the province who are in other locations. Um, but I do think we're going to be fighting um, and it's going to become much more complicated for us to get people to visit the town as people start leaving our country, but might feel uncomfortable coming this way. Um, I think it's also really important that we be really well aware of it because the amount of travel, now I don't have this statistic and I can only share the statistic with you as it impacts Deerhurst, but um, Huntsville in general doesn't see a large percentage of international travelers. They're coming. There's no question that they're coming. Um, what I've sort of tended to see over the last, you know, many years that I've been in the business in Muskoka is Ontario starts to see the travelers visiting us internationally when the West Coast is filled up. So maybe that's gonna happen at some point a little bit more quickly. Um, but the fact is that we are, I think we rely so heavily on Ontario, which has made things maybe easier for us in the last 15 months. 
but I do think, uh, Tim, it will be, it certainly will be more complicated. Follow up? Yes, thank you. Quick follow up. Um, is there any discussions or planned discussions with, with the various level of governments about what's going on on the border and when things are going to be reopened or? Um, so we haven't had that discussion at the map board level. Um, uh, nor the Halabra level, uh, but I'm the president of the Ontario Restaurant Hotel Motel Association. Um, and there is a lot of talk at our board level there about applying some pressure to government. Uh, and I also know the Hotel Association of Canada, who I work quite closely with, is also um, creating a dialogue about it as well. Thank Any you. Any other questions from council? Okay, Jesse, thanks for that presentation. Thank you for your time today, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, we have a deputation tonight as well, and that is Chrissy King from Big Brothers Big Sisters of Muskoka. Welcome, Chrissy. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. Um, I also have a short presentation for you, so I will just share my screen. And can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So tonight, our, our mission and vision and strategic goals at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Muskoka to demonstrate to you the importance of mentoring, to explore our current programs and our impact, to illustrate the need for mentoring in Muskoka and also to talk about how to get involved. So our mission and vision at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Muskoka is we commit to Muskoka's young people that we will be leaders in providing them with the highest quality volunteer-based mentoring programs. And we envision a Muskoka where every child who needs a mentor can have a mentor. So we think that mentoring is very important in the community because we serve children in the community who face adverse childhood experiences, otherwise known as ACEs. So whether that be bullying, social isolation, um, you know, divorce in the home, a wide range of things, we are working with kids who just need a little bit of support. Um, and it's also an opportunity for them to have fun. And as far as their big brothers and big sisters go, um, you know, it builds, it just builds a stronger sense of community for, for the mentors as well. Our strategic goals over the next couple of years are to increase our impact. So we really want to serve even more kids than we are serving now. We want to decrease our wait list and make sure we are reaching all of the, the children in the community who need additional support. We want to enhance our sustainability. So we wanna make sure that we are around for years to come to make sure we are able to support those children um, from you know, now and into the future. We want to amplify our voice. So through you know, meetings like this and other information sessions, we want to get the word out that Big Brothers Big Sisters of Muskoka is operating, mentoring services are available and you know, we really hope that people access them. And we want to strengthen our community leadership as far as you know, getting the word out about mentoring and how impactful it can be. So why is mentoring important? I mentioned on the previous slide that we serve children who face adverse childhood experiences. So over 80% of the youth we serve have experienced two or more ACEs in their lifetime. Um, and there was a study that was done recently by the CDC that proved that experiencing ACEs in childhood actually increase the risk of negative health outcomes for the individual's lifetime, um, whether that be, you know, risk of ongoing disease, depression, um, different, different things like that. So our, our mentoring services can actually act as a buffer. You know, unfortunately, we're not able to take away all of the, the ACEs that someone might experience, but we can help mitigate the effects. And through our mentoring services, help build self-esteem, help build resiliency that will serve this child throughout their lifetime and in the end build stronger communities. 
So this is just a little anecdote of one of our little brothers in our program. So when this little brother started in the program, he was really shy, um, wasn't engaging in the classroom, just you know, really wasn't getting out there. And so after a few months in the program, his big brother and his teacher actually let us know that, you know, he was really starting to come out of his shell. He was building self-esteem. He was not only engaging more um, in a, you know, real way with his big brother, he was also starting to engage with his peers and raise his hand in class. So we see that, you know, even through a few months of this relationship, he was able to build self-esteem and start engaging more in the classroom, which again, will just serve him as he continues on throughout his life. So the programs we have at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Muskoka are in-school mentoring, which is a site-based program. So our mentors actually go into the schools for an hour a week and mentor kids in the in the school property. Um, this program is specifically, you know, around academic engagement and getting kids to engage in the classroom. Uh, this past year, we did continue this program, but it was all virtual. The PRISM program is specific to supporting LGBTQ plus youth in the community. Uh, the Big G program is our, our newest program. It's really exciting. So mentoring across generations, it's an intergenerational mentoring program which matches uh, someone who is 55 plus, so your big grandparent um, with uh, little. We have your standard big brothers, big sisters mentoring and also big couples mentoring. So this year in our in-school mentoring program, which again was virtual, we served 14 children. Um, we actually had two kids in Huntsville who we served and those children have moved on to our community-based program. So they both received a big and now they're continuing with the program in the community. So that's really exciting. We serve 20 community-based matches right now. So six big brother matches, 13 big sister matches and one big couple match. And through COVID-19, um, you know, it definitely changed mentoring, but it has not stopped it. So through the pandemic, we created uh, virtual matches and provided them with activity kits and virtual toolkits. So different games and art supplies and things for them to be able to connect. So even though they're over Zoom like this, they have the same things to, to do together to help keep that relationship strong. We also hosted virtual group events, including bagel pizza night, science nights, uh, trivia nights, ice cream social, green thumb get together. Um, so lots of different things to help build community amongst our mentees and mentors. We have continued to accept applications for mentees and mentors, and we are allowing in-person meetings in accordance with provincial health and safety guidelines. So um, matches are able to meet in person again as of now, um, provided that they're comfortable with doing so. If they prefer to stay virtual, that's of course completely fine. Um, but more mentors are still needed. So we do currently have 31 littles on our wait list. So nine from Bracebridge, 10 in Gravenhurst, nine in Huntsville, one in Milford Bay and two in Severn Bridge. And you can see the breakdown of little sisters versus little brothers and prism littles. So littles who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and these kids, you know, are, are waiting to be matched. Some are newer to the wait list and some have been on there for a while. So if there's anybody watching who's interested in becoming a mentor, um, please contact us. Our agency focus in the next year, again, is to increase our community outreach. So through talks like this, really letting people know that we are open, we're taking applications, uh, we would love to, to help you on your mentoring journey. Or if you know a child in your life who could benefit from a mentor, also reach out to us. Uh, we want to enhance agency engagement. So we will continue to offer online programming to our matches as well as our waitlisted kiddos to help build that strong community. And we will continue to innovate our events and initiatives. So we've moved to completely virtual fundraisers you know, for the last year and we'll continue to do so until we can um, get back into in-person events. So how can you get involved? Uh, again, volunteer. Could you be our next big? There are nine kids on our waitlist from Huntsville. So four little sisters, four little brothers, and one little who's in the PRISM program um, who are waiting for their big. So if you are interested, please give us a call. 
You can like and follow us on social media. Our handle is at BBBS Muskoka. That's where you can stay up to date on all of the stuff that's going on with us. Um, consider joining our board of directors. We are always looking for, for great members to join and, and you know, help us out with their expertise. So please give us a call or send us an email. Um, and you can share and participate in fundraising or outreach events. So just a quick mention of our fundraiser that is ongoing right now is gift card survivor. So it's a raffle where you sign up with a team or you can sign up just by yourself. And basically we will pull out your names. You want to actually be the survivor. So you wanna be the last three names pulled and your team can win a bunch of gift cards. So registration ends this Friday and then draws start next week and it's a, a chance to win a bunch of gift cards to help you enjoy patio season at a variety of our local restaurants throughout Muskoka. Um, and just thank you for, for having me on today and letting me speak to you. I'll stop share um, if there's any questions. So thank you so much. Okay, thanks for that, Chrissy. I will go counsel for any questions. Councilor Schumacher. Thank you, Chrissy. <laughs> Great presentation. As a board member, I am quite happy to see that we did have 10 on the wait list and we are down to nine for the Huntsville area. So yay, we've got one off, but yeah. I guess that is my thing is anyone out there watching, what does it take for commitment to maybe be a mentor or big brother? Absolutely. Great question. Thank you for asking that. So for our community-based programs, it is a commitment of one match meeting per week and the expectation is about two hours per week so that sounds really scary don't let me scare you off right away it's really you know just about going doing an activity where you're really engaging right so if that activity is going and taking a walk going to get some ice cream um, going to kick the soccer ball around um you know it's really about just taking the time to be together so even though again two hours might seem like a lot. If you're just going and hanging out and having a good time, that's really what it's all about. So it's it's not um, that scary. I know I've, I've spoken with some of our mentors recently and that's what they've said is like, they were really scared when they first started. They're like, I don't know if I if I have time. And it's, it's really, you do have time just to go and have a little bit of fun. Um, and then for our in-school program, the commitment is a little bit less. It's only one hour per week um, and it's on school property. Um, but the commitment for, for both of those programs is a year minimum. So for the in-school program, it's just the school year. And for the community-based matches, we would, we would expect that the match would last at least a year um, because if it were to end shorter than that, it's, it you know, could potentially do more, more damage than good. Just further to that question, Chrissy, when, when you get a match of a, of a big and a little, do they set their own schedules or do they is there something that they have to follow? Nope, not at all. So each match is completely unique. And so what we do at the agency is we are kind of your sounding board. We're there to help and answer questions. But we, what we call the, the, relationship is like the big three. So it's the family, so the child and their parents or guardians, and then the, the match or the, the mentor rather, and then us at the agency. So all of the people in the relationship are really involved. So the parents and the mentor can talk and say, you know, Wednesday works this week, Friday works next week. It's totally up to them. There's no schedule. And we, as the, the agency, don't necessarily need to know beforehand what the schedule is, but we will contact you just to see how it's going to make sure that you're able to contact the parents to, to make those meetings that, you know, the relationship is moving in the direction that we're, we're all looking for it to go. Any other questions, Council? Councilor Withy? Thank you, Worship. And, and Christy, I, I just want to say thank you for everything you do. I think this is an excellent program and you it doesn't happen without your hard work. Thank you. We we really appreciate it. And um, you know, just thank you to to you and to the community because um, you know, the work doesn't happen without without your support. So we will send that thank you right back. Okay, thanks so much for that. Hopefully you get some interest generated from your presentation tonight. Absolutely, thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, council, we had a couple of council meetings. I have 
have a resolution moved by Councillor Thompson and seconded by Deputy Mayor Alcock, be it resolved that the special council meeting minutes dated May 21, 2021 be adopted as printed and circulated. Questions? All in favor? And that carries. And I have a resolution moved by Councillor Whitley and seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald, who I know is here, I can see his yellow hand. Be it resolved that the regular council meeting minutes dated May 25th, 2021 be adopted as printed and circulated. All in favor? And that carries. Okay, reports from committees. Um, the first report uh, is actually from the library, but I have to admit that I had a conflict at that meeting and uh, did not attend. Uh, so the minutes are in your package, but uh, I can't really provide much more than that for you. Uh, so I'm gonna move right on to the BIA Board of Management and Councillor Stone. All right, uh, not a lot of new information tonight. Uh, over 70 people painted the catch basins and they're on display until the end of July before they go into the ground. Um, more hard hats for the kids are coming, thanks to Kathy at uh, High Street Guest House, who uh, wanted, thought it was a wonderful thing that was going on, and so she purchased some, some of them for the kids. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to rec recognize three fearless entrepreneurs that dared to open a new business during a a global pandemic and Main Street construction. So there's Aesthetics by Rebecca, which has at the four-way stop, in the building at the four-way stop uh, on Dara Howell Way. Uh, Septrion Lodge, which is right beside Kent Park. They have a, a very eclectic uh, collection of, of products and many of them are locally made. And Wolf Company, which is the old TD building right across from Town Hall, uh, they're up and running and have done an absolute amazing job with their renovations. Anyways, welcome to those three businesses during this very difficult time. Okay, questions, Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. I don't have a, a question, but I, I do have a comment. And um, I just wanted to um, ask Councillor, I don't know if you would pass this on to the BIA uh, especially Morgan, I guess, with the uh, information vignettes that, that they're doing. They're incredibly good and very, very informative, and uh, they're very upbeat and fun to listen to. And, uh, you know, while I'm at it, I mean, we're doing the same thing with Public Works with uh, Director Hearn, and, and those are very, very well received as well. So, but anyway, if you just pass that on, those are tremendously uh, uh, well done and, and very well received. I agree with you, and I will pass on that message. Thanks very much. Hey. Uh, no resolution there. Uh, Councillor Stone, you're still up with the Committee of Adjustment. Um, it, it wasn't a long meeting. Things went smoothly. Um, nothing of note or controversy to speak of. Questions? Huntsville Lake Bay's Chamber of Commerce update. Councillor Wee. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Actually, uh, our meeting got postponed to next week, so I uh, have another report, but we'll have probably quite a bit to report next time, so until then. Okay, and finally, the Municipal Accommodation Tax and Tourism Update, which was just presented to us by Mr. Hamilton, so I have nothing there. Um, there was an accessibility advisory committee meeting and I have a resolution moved by Councillor Armour and seconded by Councillor Schumacher be it resolved that the accessibility advisory committee meeting minutes dated May 25th, 2021 and the recommendation contained therein be hereby adopted as printed and circulated. Questions? Seeing none, all in favor? That carries. And general committee meetings, moved by Councillor Withy, seconded by Councillor Weed, be it resolved that the general committee meeting minutes dated May 26, 2021, and the recommendations contained therein be hereby adopted as print and circulated. Questions? All in favor? Oh, oh I think Councillor Fitzgerald, are you just voting? Or did you have a question? Voting all in favor. Thank you. All in favor? And that carries. Your yellow hand is up very quickly. <laughs> uh, 
Planning Committee meeting. Uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Alcock, seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald, be it resolved that the Planning Committee meeting minutes dated June 16, 2021, and the recommendations contained therein be hereby adopted as printed and circulated. Deputy Mayor Alcock, would you like to highlight that meeting? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, and and uh, thankfully, it was was not a very long meeting. We um, the first item that, in fact, had a lot of public attention regarding a proposed um, an application for a proposed land swap uh, between a private applicant and the Muskoka Conservancy at Town Line Road and Brunel Road was withdrawn on the day of the meeting by the Conservancy. And I think they received a lot of feedback that they hadn't quite anticipated. So um, that was withdrawn. And as far as I know, there hasn't been any effort to bring it back to committee. So there was that item that we didn't have. And um, the second item, committee supported the placement of a telecommunications tower on Howland Drive with after lots of discussion with the proviso that no lighting be placed on the tower. And committee absolutely supported that particular condition. And we were told by the applicant that um, that seemed to be quite doable. And under general business, um, we had a verbal update um, on the community planning permit process. And we anticipate our, our first full draft to be uh, ready for review by council in July, perhaps August. And then Great. that was it. Thank you. I know it was a short meeting, so. <laughs> it was, I know. Even that, um, I can still extend it though to make it sound like it was longer. That's good. Uh, questions, Councillor Withy. You, you extend it by talking about things that didn't happen. That was the beautiful part of it. Uh, anyway, the question, so the question I had is, how tall is this tower not to have lights on it? Are we uh, going to be uh, having issues with I, I, if I may, Your Worship, I think, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, other committee members, 45, 45 feet, um, and it's well within, it's fine. It, we're not asking them to do anything that's not legal. There were other examples of, of similar towers without lighting. They still have to go to Transport Canada, et cetera, before it's, yeah. it's fine. We just put the condition on it because we wouldn't have approved it had if Transport Canada came back and said there was lighting required. That's good. Any if other I questions? May, if I may, well, Your Worship, the good. reason why, just to Councillor Withy's comment about talking about something that didn't come, I thought just in case people who didn't attend the meeting wanted to know what happened to that item and they didn't know that it had been pulled, that was why I thought I'd, I'd make reference to it. I was joking, Councillor Alcock. I understand completely. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I'll call the question then. All in favor? And that carries. Councillor Fitzgerald, where's your yellow hand? There it is. Thank you. Uh, we have a road assumption campus trail. I have a resolution moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Armour. Be it resolved that Council approved the request to assume full ownership and maintenance of campus trail and further that a road assumption bylaw be presented for Council's consideration. Madam CAO, I understand you're speaking to this one. I am, thank you, Your Worship. The report is very detailed. It's just a administrative process with respect to the road assumption and our operations division has confirmed that they met all the requirements. So it's just a procedural matter. Are there any questions from council? Seeing none, all in favor? And that carries. Okay, uh, this has come back from last month, the life-saving equipment at town swimming areas. I'll read the resolution first. I have a resolution moved by Councillor Fitzgerald, seconded by Councillor Stone, be it resolved that staff be directed to purchase, install, and maintain the appropriate life-saving equipment with signage at the Port Sydney Beach and Hutchison Beach locations as a phase one implementation. 
and further that any costs associated with the installation of the life-saving equipment be taken from the aquatics operating budget and further that staff be directed to create and implement an operation plan to include waterfront access equipment and signage and update and recategorize recategorize all town water access points and further that staff be directed to report back to committee with future recommended recommended phases on the project and cameron would you like to highlight anything in this report thank you your worship good evening council you can see that in front of you is a report that you asked staff to bring back uh, regarding a deputation uh, and a request that was made on may 26 for a life-saving buoy to be placed at Port City Beach. Uh, you asked some of the details and they're uh, outlined in the report below. Um, and I'm here to answer any of your questions. Okay, council questions. And I see Director Babineau is here as well. So any questions from council? Or are you happy with the resolution as read? Okay, I see no questions. I will call the question. All in favor? And that carries. And thank you, staff, for putting that together and doing it quickly as our summer season is upon us. Um, reports from municipal officers. Uh, we have a COVID-19 reopening plan for information. Madam CAO. Thank you, Worship. So the report is very detailed, and as Council is very well aware that the, the changing landscape is, is, is crazy with everything that's happening with COVID. Um, we are certainly headed in the right direction, um, which, is, which is great news. So what's before you today um, is a report that speaks to how the Town of Huntsville will be moving forward with our reopening plan. As I'm sure you'll recall back in November of 2020, uh, the province did implement a response framework, which was really based on the category in which each region fell. So it was more so based on the number of COVID cases and uh, the level, the number per 100,000 population. That's what the, the response framework was based on. Uh, so as things have changed and vaccinations are increasing every day, uh, the province has switched the, um, the reopening to a roadmap, which is really much based on the, the public measures and the province-wide vaccination rate and the improvements in the key public health and health system indicators. So switching from the number of cases more so to the number of vaccinations. So um, staff have been obviously adjusting our reopening plans based on the three steps that have been implemented by the province. The one challenge that we do face is the fact that until such time that the regulations are actually passed, it's very difficult for us to know the level of detail that's able to come with each phase. Um, so as you're aware, uh, last week, it was announced that we were moving to step two um, as of uh, Wednesday of this week, which was a few days earlier than anticipated by the province. Uh, and we're not quite sure how quickly we'll move to the third step. Uh, originally, it was roughly 21 days between each step, but thank goodness, um, since we have some very positive um, indicators moving forward, they are advancing it. The challenge with step three is we have no regulation. So we really have very little detail on what's allowed to happen. Um, so that's what the, the staff have prepared the reopening plan based on what we know today. But as those regulations are released, we may be able to adjust things ever so slightly. Uh, so it, it's really, we're just waiting until we move to the next step. Um, but there are some permissions that are in place currently now, as you can see from the, the chart. And I hope you're able to enlarge it so that you could actually read it. it you weren't able to enlarge it. It was pretty tiny. Um, so we can, we can certainly make sure that that's sent to you so it can be enlarged in a format that's a bit easier to read. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I, I can tell you that we are ready to go. We're very anxious to, to get our community back to enjoying the services that the town of Huntsville provides, but we also respect uh, the need for doing it cautiously moving forward. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, and I would appreciate that uh, link to a chart a little larger. I have my magnifying glass here and I still couldn't see it, so. <laughs> oh, I, I do apologize. I thought that you could enlarge it uh, through the system, so I do apologize, Council. It's, it's hard though. If we, can, if we can get it in a, in a different format that it's easier to see, it's probably a good document to have. Absolutely. Are there questions, Council? No, you're, off, you're getting off easy. There's no questions. Questions and um, 
There's no resolution. So we'll, we'll move on to our climate change uh, emergency declaration. And I have a resolution and the clerk has told me that I should ask permission not to read it because it's about seven pages long. So with council's permission, it is the same that's in your package. It is moved by Deputy Mayor Alcock and seconded by Councillor Weeb. Um, and it would read exactly as in, as in your package. And then I have a motion to amend, which is also moved by Deputy Mayor Alcock. And I would need a seconder for it. Um, Councillor Weeb, would you be happy to do that? Okay. So the amendment is to be it resolved, the following be added to section three after the words, which will, uh, quote, enable community engagement. So the, there's, there's a line in there where we wanted to add um, specific community engagement. Um, this, is, this is really not very clear, but uh, I'm trying to find section three so I could uh, help with that. Okay, I think it says that the town of Huntsville support and participate in the establishment and operation of the District of Muskoka Community Working Group, which will provide input to the district in lower tier caps and will assist in the regular review. And that's not the section. Anyways, I hope council understands that we're adding community engagement to the resolution. All in favor of the amendment. That carries. So again, um, I will ask, For permission not to read it, and the main motion is amended, moved by Deputy Mayor Alcock and seconded by Councillor Weed. All in favor of the main motion as amended. Uh, Deputy Mayor Alcock, did you have a question first? Okay, I haven't called that question yet. Deputy Mayor Alcock. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, it was just a comment, and that I will be supporting obviously the main motion. Um, but in the appendix to that main motion under proposed climate action plan development, critical path, um, I just hope uh, that the CAO will update that to include some reference to the community consultation process, just because it identifies other tranches to how this thing is rolling out and who's responsible and it doesn't actually reference that community consultation that we've now just ensured will happen. So even though we may not know exactly when that will happen, maybe just making note of that in that, that development uh, plan, that would be really useful. Um, CAO, did you follow that request completely? I, I did follow that request. I may follow up with the deputy mayor just uh, after the meeting, just to make sure I'm clear. Okay. He's requesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. I'll call the question now. All in favor? And that is carried. Okay. Uh, clarifications. We have bylaws. Um, we have a lot of bylaws. I have a resolution moved by Councillor Schumacher and seconded by Councillor Thompson. Be it resolved that bylaw numbers. 2021-38 to 2021-49 inclusive be reported and read a first, second and third time and finally pass this 28th day of June. And I will not read all of those uh, as they as it is the same that's in your agenda package. Is that all right, Madam Clerk? That's fine, Mayor Terziano. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? That carries. Uh, we don't have any previous business. Stop that just a second. I just lost my agenda. So let me just find that again. That climate change emergency resolution that was so long that I've now lost my spot. There we go. All right. Uh, general correspondence. 
general correspondence. There's quite a bit of that and it's in your package. Um, there was a district council um, composition letter from Minister Clark from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And it was a response letter to District Chair John Clink um, once we submitted the fact that we were basically doing nothing with the district council composition. And the reply from Minister Clark really didn't tell us anything, um, but they did reply. So we assume that the status quo is, is good to go as far as the ministry is concerned for now. Um, and we're gonna go to district of Muskoka updates. Deputy Mayor Alcock, would you like to do community and planning services? Uh, sure, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll try and be brief. Uh, we had um, two invited presentations. The first one I thought was really interesting while depressing at the same time. And rather than go into all of the details about it, I would recommend to other council uh, colleagues, as well as anybody who's listening to us tonight, um, it was from Wade Matthews, who is the Muskoka Employment Partnership Project Coordinator, and it was an update on the Muskoka labor market situation, and both pre-COVID and during COVID, um, there were some really uh, shocking statistics that um, surprised a lot of us on the committee, and so much so, and very important information that uh, we asked that Wade not only present to all of uh, district council, but to each lower tier council if, if um, there's an agreement by all of us that we'd like to hear the report. And I think it would be really useful for us to, to have him present to our, our next council or general committee, whatever. Um, really, as I said, it was quite depressing at times, but important to know. So we also had another presentation from um, the director of the workforce development Fleming College. And I won't go into all of the detail, but some of you might remember that at one point, the district's role in providing employment services was taken over um, by Fleming College. Um, after the province decided to reorg all of its employment services and they created several regional bodies and to be delivered either through government or private sector or whatever. And in this case, it's being delivered by Fleming College. And frankly, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure um, how it's changed all that much, but that was our thought. We had an increase to our childcare um, fee subsidy rate. And um, we also decided to provide an increase in funding towards our causation studies in preparation for quick sampling of algae blooms for the five lakes that are currently being um, looked at for causation studies. And so it was just being proactive because in order to be able to sample if there is a bloom, it's really important to get to it right away. So we proactively are providing funding, funding to do that if that needs to be the case. We heard an update on a grant application for over 200,000 for transportation and, um, initiatives. And as we think we're, we've made the short list. So we were just again being proactive and ready to proceed with that. And we did have a matter in closed with regard to um, uh, a matter before the administrative tribunal. And um, with that, that's my report. Okay, any questions, council? Okay, um, I, I think that first presentation you're talking about, I agree it would be good for maybe to come to our council. Maybe you can follow up with our clerk and see if we can organize that. Um, great. Councillor Withy, Health Services. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, 
we had our health services committee meeting, which uh, which was last, was it last Thursday or it was a week before that? I'm losing my sense of time, but anyways, um, it was, there wasn't anything sort of um, other than the usual updates that we get about what's going on at the Pines and what's going on with uh, uh, COVID and um, the district, uh, the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Council uh, and, and uh, health unit. And uh, so there wasn't anything really that was um, noteworthy let me say, other than the usual stuff. Okay. Councillor Thompson, did you have a question? Uh, yes, yes, I do, Your Worship. Thank you. And uh, through you to Councillor Withy. Um, Councillor, um, could you bring us up to date on exactly where things are with, uh, with, uh, with Fairburn? Um, I know from what I'm hearing that we're looking for an administrator to cover both the pines and, uh, and, uh, and, a, and the, new, the, the new Fairburn build or the present one, whatever. But I'm just wondering if you give us, do you have any, any idea of time on that uh, counselor? Like actually, actually there was someone hired, but it was quite some time ago. Like it wasn't just this last meeting. There is somebody in place now that's going to oversee both places. Um, and I can't, for the life of me, conjure up her name. Sorry about that, um, but that was a that was a couple meetings ago at least. Uh, I know on the Fairburn front, they're still dealing with the province as far as uh, officially changing the ownership of the of Fairburn Nursing Home to be under the district's uh, um, purview. Uh, and uh, as far as I've heard, and maybe maybe the mayor knows more about what's going on construction wise, but there wasn't anything new on that front as far as working towards drawings and getting things going so yeah we'll uh, the cao is working with the with the district on on that piece of it and maybe we'll get a report back for the july committee meeting just to see where we're at i know they're they're still working on agreements and pieces of land etc so we'll get a report for that from the cao at the next meeting and, and Councillor Thompson, I'll, I'll find out who that is, report back. Uh, Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Councillor Withy, I'm, I just am wondering if there's been any discussion about the current site that Fairburn sits on. And I, I, I believe the hospital owns that property. Is that correct? Uh, thanks. Yes, uh, technically, I mean the hospital technically owns it because it was the old hospital when the new hospital where it sits now was built in 1970, I believe, or in around there. In around there. So, I mean, yes, the hospital owns it, but it's really the province that owns it because the province owns a hospital. So, uh, no discussion. Uh, only sort of wild speculation. Um, but I do know from having been on the Fairburn board and, and the Lynn and all those places that the building itself uh, is not in good shape and is likely full of things like asbestos and what have you. So it's not a, something that can be used uh, in the future. So once once the new Fairburn is, is built and, and uh, um, everybody moved safely, uh, it will be decommissioned. Um, it's just, it, I mean, when I was on that board, we were one, you know, elevator break away from disaster. And that was, you know, every, every other week there was something. So the building's falling apart, um, you know, not to the point where it can't be inhabited now. I don't want to cause alarm in the community. We have a few <laughs> but, more uh, years of it. <laughs> yeah, so no, don't panic about that. But uh, it's, it, 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 in the future, it, it's certainly, it's not going to be turned into, anything else in its current state. And whatever is decided of it, maybe the town can get a hold of it or something for more waterfront parkland and in, in beside Mount View or something like that. It's a, it's a nice piece of property right on the river, um, but who knows? So it's owned technically by the hospital, but it's uh, really owned by the province at the end of the day. I mean, they're, they can, they're gonna say what, what's gonna go on there. 
Great. Thanks for that. I wonder if I wonder if I wonder if we should start lobbying now to, to have that maybe transferred to the municipality for municipal use. I don't know how we go about that, but um, it just says a wonderful riverfront property, and I think of um, community uses which which we could all benefit from. So I don't know how we start that process, but I think we probably should. Thanks, yeah, Councilor. Thanks. So, some of us um, were born in that hospital uh, or Fairburn in the seventies. <laughs> okay, uh, Councillor Fitzgerald, uh, thanks for asking that question to remind us all that you're here, and uh, I, I will let the public know that Council Fitch Councillor Fitzgerald is here and has been here all along, and is actually participating from um, away. He's on vacation, so his internet is sporadic, but he has uh, made the point of joining us on his vacation. So thank you for that, and. Uh, and uh, I have seen your yellow hand numerous times. Uh, Councillor Thompson, Engineering and Public Works. Uh, yes, indeed, Your Worship, uh, thank you. And um, the uh, biggest item, of course, that we discussed at um, Public Works was on the uh, last Monday and, and prior to the uh, district council meeting. So I think council, district council uh, got the same report that we did and uh, um, and the biggest issue, of course, that we were dealing with on, on uh, both the uh, the, um, the committee meeting and then at the at the, uh, at the district was with regards to our uh, diversion process uh, and uh, the trying to extend the life of our Roseborn uh, landfill site type of thing. Right now, it looks like it's going to be uh, at capacity in, in 2036, which is ahead of uh, what we had anticipated when we first developed that. And, and decided that all of the um, the uh, major landfill sites in Muskoka would be reduced to the one, and that would be Rosewarn. So um, the biggest thing that came out of it, there are several. I think there are eight bullets that are that are a part of the uh, resolution that came out of that meeting, um, and uh, they're really not too much different from what I think I've discussed earlier that had been discussed at previous meetings, and that was uh, in different ways that we could be uh, reducing um, the amount of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, trash and garbage that is going into the landfill site. And a lot of that has to do with diversion. Muskoka has got a pitiful uh, percentage rate of 35% of, uh, of diversion, whereas some municipalities in the province are 60 and we hear that some are even at 70% diversion. So, so we've got to really up our game in that particular area. And so the, uh, I guess the telltale part of the resolution is the last uh, therefore, and it said be it resolved the staff be directed to bring forward the estimated costs, impacts on the waste management system and service level changes for the following considerations during the 2022 budget discussion. So that would be for, usually that will be happening for this fall, because as you know, we, we do our very best to uh, uh, discuss a lot of budget issues before the, uh, before the uh, end of the uh, fiscal year. So. But yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions if, uh, with regards to that. I've got the uh, list of everything that's being uh, suggested and, and uh, be glad to share that with anyone that wants to know your worship. Thanks for that. Deputy Mayor Alcock. Uh, thank you, your worship. And thank you, Councillor Thompson for that uh, overview. I have a quick question is, did, they, did you guys discuss what the causes are for our pitiful record of, of diversion in Muskoka? I I, uh, I know I was telling a few people about about exactly what you just presented, and um, I missed it. So I, I think we've been we've gone over some of the re main reasons, like the bins and things. But I wondered if there's more information that you can share. Actually, I, I as to why no, I can't. I don't know. I think it's partly education, uh, Councillor uh, Alcock, but. Um, I think there are other areas that have already sort of lowered the boom and, and, and uh, um, imposed st uh, stricter uh, uh, conditions with regards to the amount of allowable uh, bags per week type of thing, right? We haven't been doing that. We haven't done that. Uh, but it's definitely uh, uh, it's part of the, the resolution that I think you probably saw or you heard about it at that district. Uh, but it would be probably pretty drastic reduction in, in and like right now we're allowed three bags a week type of thing, right? And, and, I, and I think, yeah, and, and we're talking about reducing that to one. Um, also improving, the biggest challenge I find and something that's always been bothering me about uh, 
our diversion uh, programs that we have at the district is the fact that organics is restricted to a very, very small area and a very small area of Huntsville. I, I think Councillor uh, uh, Councillor Armour probably benefits from it, but he's probably maybe one of the only councillors in town that actually has that. So the idea is to expand that. And I don't know what your personal um, experience is, uh, Councillor, but I know mine. I'd say that uh, you know 80% of the weight uh, of the weight of my trash that goes out, and it's very it's it's generally like one small kitchen catcher bag a week type of thing. But I'd say 80% of the weight of that is just. Uh, it's just organics type of thing that could be diverted type of thing. So, so things like that, um, um, yeah. And and then the the province has gone to single streaming too with regards to um, to uh, uh, the blue blocks program. So that will probably increase uh, uh, the the amount of diversion for for um, for all of us for all of Ontario, but definitely for Muskoka as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I think you're right on the organics. I, I have a compost. I, I, I don't have pickup, but I think if I didn't, you're right. It, my, my garbage would increase substantially. So mm -hmm. you, yeah. I think that's a really important one. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, that brings us to District Council on Finance and Corporate Services. And uh, uh, Councillor Thompson has outlined uh, most of District Council because we really just uh, was one of the shortest meetings ever, and we uh, approved uh, minutes from the committees, and we spent some time saying goodbye to Anna Landry, the uh, HR director at the district, who is retiring and uh, will certainly be a loss. And uh, <clears throat> then we had a closed session, which we can't talk about. So that was pretty much district. But on the other hand, finance and corporate services was the longest meeting I've ever been in at, at district finance. <laughs> And um, we looked at budget guidelines, we looked at status of reserves, um, and we looked at setting the budget guidelines for the rate supported budget, uh, being water and sewer and garbage, and the um, tax supported budget. So lots of discussion about that. We had a discussion about the local share funding for the hospital. Uh, passed a resolution forward to council on that to start putting money away at the district level. And we had a long conversation about OPP detachment boards. And for Huntsville, um, it's much simpler than, uh, than some of the others. The recommendation from the district is that it would be Huntsville and Lake of Bays um, with one OPP detachment board. And the composition of that would be five people being one elected official for each municipality, uh, one community represent, representative from each municipality and one provincial appointee. So that would be a, a small board of five. And that's really what the uh, province I believe recommends, the smaller the board, the better. Um, to that end, there will be a meeting with um, the district will hold uh, within the next 10 days or so, I think, with Lake of Bays and Huntsville to see if they're comfortable with that. I don't believe we'll have a full council meeting with it, so we will probably pick enough councillors to sit at that meeting um, to um, provide feedback um, in conjunction with Lake of Bays. Um, happy to answer any questions on any of that, if there are any. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to COVID update, and I'm actually going to ask the CAO if she wouldn't mind this. So your worship, your worship I, I have my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor. No, Go ahead. That's all right. I'm probably on the third screen that you have in front of you. <laughs> but, I only have one. Well, I just wasn't looking. <laughs> I, was, uh, I, I was wondering this tribunal, this this small five person group. What's what's the role of this group? Well, basically it's to oversee how the OPP operate. Um, I guess, well, this has been going on for a couple of years. We were at a meeting during COVID, I wanna say a full year or a year and some ago down in Aurelia. Um, lots of parts of the province have police boards, but the province wants every detachment to have their own police policing board. Um, I, I think basically, Madam CAO, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think basically the detachment commander would report to the board. 
That's correct. Yeah, the board, the detachment commander would report to the board and they would see oh, the day-to-day -day operations. They'd oversee them. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I guess that was my question. What does oversee mean? Is it going to make budget decisions or is it, does it have any teeth or is it just a sounding board to make sure there's some sort of level of transparency with the public? That's, no, that's kind of what yeah. I was after. No, I, I think it will have, have some teeth for sure. Um, is everybody still there? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, it, it'll be a board with teeth. Um, we just don't have that many details yet. And, it, and it's the district that's overseeing setting them up. So I think probably, Councillor, I would be asking you to participate in that meeting in, in a week or so. Okay, okay. happy to. Um, so I was just going to ask the CAO to give a brief update on the uh, meeting um, that she just had with the representatives from the COVID assessment center and also the vaccination center. Sure, thank you, Your Worship. So with respect to the assessment center in discussions with Dr. Marr, who's overseeing the center, she has indicated that the numbers have decreased, which is it's a good thing. Um, she has indicated that they will continue to operate the assessment center until the end of August, uh, most likely with reduced hours. Uh, and if there is a need for us to relocate them because we need to potentially move the vaccination center, that is an option. Uh, it was noted that uh, if the numbers continue to decline and they do have to go to one assessment center, that it's most likely that it will be in Bracebridge. And the reason being is because Bracebridge has a dedicated building for the assessment center. And they actually have this center uh, staffed by doctors and, and nurses from the hospital. So uh, from a resource perspective, it would make more sense. Um, so we're keeping in touch with, with Dr. Marr, but um, until further notice, they will continue to operate uh, most likely with reduced hours. So as that information is finalized, we'll make sure that goes to the, the website. With respect to the vaccination center, as you can appreciate, they still hope to be doing large numbers of vaccinations for some time. Uh, I believe that a major, a major number of us can actually get second vaccinations um, as of today. Uh, so they'll continue to operate with the larger numbers. If they do see a decline, they can be relocated to the active living center. Uh, we currently have an agreement with Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit until the end of October uh, for them to utilize space within the Canada Summit Center, but we can we can take them from the arena floor to the active living center if need be. So, uh, so things are obviously headed in the right direction, but we still have both of those functions operating out of our Canada Summit Center. And, and I think, um, I think I'm looking uh, or I just want to update council. There has been a, uh, I'm, I'm laughing, Councillor Weeb's registered for a second jab. <laughs> um, I've been con contacted by the, the figure skating club and the, they have requested that we move the, uh, the vaccination center into the JAP and, and, and have the Don Lock available for, for ICE in August. But staff have made it uh, um, have advised us that we can't actually do that. The vaccination center, as long as it's on the arena floor, it needs to be on the Don Lock. So if they need to stay there, um, when ICE is going in, um, it will be going into the Jack as opposed to the Don when, when that time comes. Okay, um, Councillor Withy. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so just to be clear, the assessment center, that's where you go get a test. Correct. Yeah. So if so, if somebody needs is having a procedure, and they have to they have to they have to have a positive or a negative test to go to have their procedure, and that location is closed. Where is there somewhere else in Huntsville that they can do that, or are they going to have to travel all the way to Bracebridge just to get a test? Because you can't take that test in the in the pharmacy. They don't do those. Yeah, unless, unless the hospital here in Huntsville is planning to make arrangements um, to do the test, because I know a lot of this pre-op work is for, for appointments here at our own hospital, uh, Bracebridge will be the, the closest location for that test. Because I, I had a procedure at RVH last week, and I had to get the test at the assessment center to go to Barrie, so... Anyway, it seems like it'll be inconvenient for people that are 
not yeah. going to Huntsville yeah. Hospital for procedure. And my, my understanding is at the um, at the testing center right now, about 40% of all tests being done each day there are being done for, for medical appointments. So free off. So yeah, you have to have you, them, like, you like maybe as many as 15 tests a day are being done for for pre off. Yeah, okay. it just seems like hardship for people to have to travel there. One of the reasons we worked so hard to to get a test center here. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Armour. Well, thank you, Worship. Just a, a note to yourself and to friends. I know they had a significant number of people not show up for their appointments last week for their second shot or first shot for COVID vaccine here in Huntsville. So I think it's just something we should remind people if you make that appointment, please go. And I don't know if anybody's seen the social media from the weekend in Gravenhurst, the big lineup they had there, they opened it up to the public and um, people stood in the pouring rain to get their shots. So if it's your turn, please go ahead and get it done. Absolutely. Um, because when you don't show up for your appointment, there was somebody else that wanted that appointment and couldn't get it. So it's important that everybody get both their vaccinations, but it's also important not to not show up for that appointment. Councillor Thompson. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, I, tr I totally agree. Um, my experience has been um, on two different occasions. If you have a, an appointment, um, and uh, my first one was up at Sundry South River on April the 1st. Honestly, the system is so so slick. I mean, uh, I took my daughter to uh, an appointment yesterday. Her appointment was for 12 noon. She was in and out by 12.15 and, and the place was busy. So the system they have set up is really, really great. And, and uh, uh, I would recommend that anybody has, has any reservations about timing and that kind of thing. These, these people are really, really good. They've got it so well organized and, and uh, uh, really, really, really professionally and well done. So anyway, that's just what I wanted to say. Thanks. Okay, Council, um, an information item, um, Muskoka Pride Week, the virtual flag raising will be July 19th, 2021, as that is the kickoff to Muskoka Pride Week. Um, it's too bad that we still can't do real flag raisings, but I'm sure they're coming soon. And with that, I think we're going into closed session. I have a resolution moved by Councillor Armour, seconded by Councillor Withy. Be it resolved that the next portion of the meeting be closed to the public, commencing now at 7.07 p.m. For the purpose of considering the following matters pertaining to the following sections under the Municipal Act, Section 239.2, litigation or potential litigation, Section F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, confidential report development 2021-75, Ontario Land Tribunal, and Section 239.2, litigation or potential litigation, confidential report development 2021-76, Ontario Land Tribunal. All in favor? And that carries. And that is our cue to zoom out and zoom back in under the closed session link.
here. Councillor Thompson, can you please log out and go into the closed session? Councillor Thompson, can you hear me?
one, two, three, four. Are we back live now? Okay. Uh, just a note, there are no resolutions coming out of closed session. So that brings us to the end of our meeting. And I have a resolution uh, moved by Councillor Thompson, who's not back with us yet. So I'm going to change that to moved by Councillor Armour. A resolution moved by Councillor Armour and seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald, be it resolved that confirmation bylaw 2021-50 be received, numbered and read a first, second and third time and finally passed this 28th day of June, 2021. All in favor. Right. Have a resolution moved by Councillor Withy, seconded by Deputy Mayor Alcott. Be it resolved that we do now adjourn at 7.24 p.m. All in favor. That carries. And Perhaps. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks, Councillor.